Hello, hello, Dan. Hi there. How are you? So far, so good. Wonderful. I'm in one of my offices. Oh, lovely. So, uh, yeah, just getting all, all set up at the moment, waiting for Annette to, uh, to join okay. us. We do a lot by Zoom. We even do schools in uh, China. All right, yeah. And uh, Sri Lanka by Zoom. Hmm. Yeah, it's very um, helpful, isn't it? Well, we were the first drama examination board to do online exams when the COVID started. Hmm. Yeah, very, very good idea on, on your part. Yeah, it's um, yeah. very, well, in, integral, isn't it, really, to these yeah. days? Have you had a nice week? Well, it's been rather busy, really. Mm -hmm. um, I know the feeling. <laughs> um, Oh, by the way, I, I spoke to uh, Director Wallace Hussein last last week about um, Marco oh. Polo, and uh, he did he did speak very highly of you um, as as an actor, and he, he thought you were great to work with and and very talented. So I thought I'd just pass it oh, on to you. That's very nice. I must say that when when I was in LA, when Tuck won all the prizes, mm. I was so amazed that. The Hollywood, what the Hollywood Reporter said, and all the the critics. It was uh, it was very very pleasing. Oh, good, good. Um, we'll certainly touch upon Tucked um, probably more towards the, the end of the uh, discussion. But I think it's something that a lot of the audience would probably like to to, to hear about. A lot of them might not be aware of it. So, um, yeah. in fact, I think I think uh, Jamie, the director, who was really uh, buggering around Brighton, trying to make little movies and this, that, and the other. And when we were in LA, he was signed up by one of the biggest Hollywood agents. And I believe he's just gone to Los Angeles to direct a film. Oh, wonderful. So, what a funny business. Mm. Oh, yes, it does sort of seem what to be the. Business. Yeah. One thing that's quite interesting about doing these events is, is how interconnected. The world is in terms of you, you an actor's appearing in, in this show, the director then cast them later on, and everybody's kind of sort of all converges in and out of each, weaves in and out of each other's lives. It's quite um, fascinating, really. We had a nice comment from a gentleman called Rick who's watching. Uh, we're looking forward to this. Thanks so much. Uh, Darren and Annette are both legends of the acting game. Huh. Um, I think we'd all agree on that one. I think it's probably because I'm so old. Well, if you look at your um, credits, you know, it, it's a very impressive uh, career, if I, I may say so. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Hmm. I've never done an audition. Oh, wow. Yeah. I believe people do auditions now for everything. But in the other days, you know, like victim and all the rest of it, the director said to you, would you like to, you know, play this part? Mm. Like Frank Sinatra, uh, I met Brad Dexter, who was the producer, primarily because he saved Sinatra's life. And he just said, look, you know, here's the part. Would you like to do it? Mm. it, it he, was, a... he was a nice man, Frank Sinatra. Oh, good, good. So, despite the fame, quite down to earth. Well, you know, every when I did the film, he was the greatest star in the world. I mean, none greater. Hmm. And everybody wanted something from him. You know, they, you know, he was surrounded by people who wanted something. Yeah. And uh, I think it was the Mail or the no, no, the Mirror or something asked me to write or to have it ghosted an article working with Frank Sinatra hmm. for, I don't know, 10 grand or something. And I said, no, I said, no, I don't want to do that. That's tacky. Anyway, he must have heard that this young English actor turned down all this money 
to do a story about him. So there was me. I obviously didn't want anything from him. And so he was amazingly kind to me. Unbelievably kind. I mean, there's a very famous story when we were going to a film in Copenhagen and anyway, they changed it to Will and Garden City and he said, go and have a holiday on me. Oh, wow. I, you know, taken a lot of money and uh, hello, Annette. Hello, hello, Darren. How are you? So far, so good. So far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. I'm doing it in one of my offices, if you can see. One of your offices. How many have you got? About four or five. Well, we're now one of the leading drama examination boards in the country. How do you do that? What are you doing? I mean, I don't understand that. Well, it's, it, the company that I bought is called New Era Academy of Drama and Music, but it started in 1941, not with me. <laughs> <laughs> But um, we are now, uh, we, we, we publish uh, things like, um, you know, the syllabuses and teachers and drama schools take the syllabus and they teach their students and then we send examiners to give them uh, reports or certificates and we're accredited by Ofqual and so we're one of the few now who is accredited by Ofqual, who are drama um, examination boards. Gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, we're, we're in Hong Kong, mm. Sri Lanka, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, China now, really? uh, Dubai and all those sort of places. Wow, I had no idea. It's mischief. <laughs> the what? It keeps me out of mischief. I doubt that. <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Philip. Uh, Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you? Yeah, yeah, very good, thanks. Yeah. Good. Um, so we're just waiting for a few more people to, to log on. So if we just give them two minutes and then we'll uh, then we'll get started. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for everybody that's that's joined us thus far. Um, we're going to be watching the our own copies of the episode um, as we as we uh, as we go along. Um, so if anybody wants to, who does want, you don't necessarily have to watch the episodes as we go along. Um, uh, it's just there as a springboard for reference, and it might um, um, it was, uh, perhaps um, be the start of of questions that the audience might might have for ha have for us. So it's something that we're we'll watching in, in in the background. Okay. Um, so if you do want to to watch it along with us, uh, we're just going to uh, freeze frame on the opening shot of the of the episode, which is the the clouds in the uh, in the sky. So if you just want to get that that ready, and then we'll begin uh, shortly. Hey, okay. you. I bet you don't know the true story about the prisoner. Well, no. Do I not? No. Well, I was going to be the permanent number two. Because in those days, I was with the grade organization, Lou Grade, yeah, Lou yeah. Grade who were friends of the family. <coughs> and uh, George Markstein and, and uh, Lou Grade said, uh, we're going to do this series based on Danger Man, you know, with this, and we want you to be the permanent number two. So I said, OK. Anyway, George came along afterwards and said, he won't have you. <laughs> he won't have you. And he said, not only will he not have you, but he doesn't want any number twos. And George said, well, this is ridiculous. Where do all the number twos come from? Where do they all go to? <laughs> so uh, he actually walked out after a few episodes. And then he said, look, I'm going to do Special Branch. Will you play the lead in Special Branch for me? So I said, yeah, might as well. <laughs> might as well. A lot of stories about it, actually. Oh, my goodness me. Because, I mean, I was, my family were very great friends with uh, Lou Grade and Leslie Grade, who you know in those days. Oh, with Lou Grade. Oh, with Lou, yeah, yeah. In fact, I, um, a friend uh, of my father, well, he wasn't my father, actually, but he said that, you know, before you were born, your mother and Lou Grade 
were having an affair. Oh. And, uh, and then my father, well, he wasn't my father because at the end of her life, my mother said to me, Harry wasn't your father, which is a wonderful thing to say. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Oh, gosh. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Lou Grade was always very kind to me, you know. And so I was, we were, you know, the family were friendly. He was a great man, actually. Oh, he was wonderful. He was. And Leslie was the one with the real brains. Yes, he was. But he died of a stroke. He was a very nice man. But Lou was the great... Well, I knew him vaguely, but not like I knew Lou. Yeah. I know. Well, yes, my mother at the end of her life said, Harry wasn't your father. <laughs> well, all I can say is that I used to, you know, I smoked cigars since I was 40. Oh, God. I'm glad I, I'm glad I didn't marry you. <laughs> There's many a woman who can say that. <laughs> yes, yeah, cigars, me and cigars or even cigarettes do not go together. No, but you don't inhale cigars. I've never smoked a cigarette. No, but you, if you're if you um, smelling them on someone else, you're inhaling them, and it's dreadful. I know. My wife won't have me in the house. So oh, good. I smoke my cigars, I do it in the garden. Oh, good. That's mm -hmm. absolutely right. I do exactly the same thing, but I keep you in the garden forever. <laughs> Again, you're speaking like some of my ex. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, so so I think. Very nice man, Lou Grade, Lord Grade. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. He was. So I think we'll make, we'll make a start, uh, everybody. So um, if you've got your episodes to hand, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, press play in five. So five, four, three, two, one, and play. Um, so the first question I have for you both is an audience question um, from Kenneth. Did you both have much of an idea of what this series was about when you were attached to it? Was it kind of, because it is quite a um, a complex series, was it kind of gone through with you at the time? Who's going to answer this first? Uh, I think you ought to, because my yeah. story is pretty I, strong. I had absolutely no idea from day one to the day we finished. No idea. Well, I went to other people. I went to Mark Eden. We talked and I said, tell me what it's about. He said, I don't know. <laughs> but something, the extraordinary thing is, now I've only seen the episode. I don't think I saw it originally because I was working. I didn't get, and <clears throat> in more recent times, someone sent me a copy of it and I was able to, to look at it. Hmm. Um, that was a while ago, so I couldn't uh, do it. And then you sent me this copy, so I watched it. It hit me that um, I, I really disliked Patrick in a very big way. Well, he the, earned it too. He earned that. The 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 true story. Oh. Wait, I have to finish. Hold on. Go go. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, uh, yes, so when I saw the episode again, it occurred to me, this not this today, but this last time, I thought, I would never thought I would gave a very good performance in it. But when I looked at it again, it actually wasn't bad, particularly a couple of the scenes. I didn't have all that much to do. It wasn't great, but the first scene particularly. And I thought, I think the reason I gave a decent performance was because of Patrick. I hated him so much. And he sparked me, you know, and I would have liked more scenes that had more spark because I was ready to go. And uh, and he was very no he was not nice to me on the set. Well, no, I heard that from a lot of women. No, basically, he was around the twist. Yes, he was. But the true story, the true story is, is that I was with the Grade Organization, as I mentioned to you. And for people who don't know, the Grade Organization, Lou Grade, Leslie Grade, owned everything. They, they owned the whole industry. And uh, in fact, someone said that my mother, before I was born, well, were boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, in, so that's how close we were. 
Anyway, so they said to me, we are doing this series and we want you to play what is called the, the permanent number two. So I said, yes, okay, yeah, I mean, fine. And George Markstein, who was the creator of The Prisoner. And anyway, a bit later on, he said, well, McGowan won't have you. He, he, he won't have you. We, we worked together before and there was a little bit of, you know, hiatus to put it mildly and so I said that's okay he won't have you not only will he not have you he will not have anybody playing number two and George Markstein said well this is ridiculous where do all these new bloody number twos come from where do they all go to anyway so we're going to film the first you know the episode which had to be rewritten because it was going to introduce me as the number two so I'm sitting in the dressing room and there's a knock on the door early in the morning and the director walks in, um, a man called Asher, lovely man. He said, hello, Darren. He said, I, um, we haven't worked together. And, you know, and he said, may I, uh, may I ask you a question? I said, I, he said, as a director, I shouldn't ask you this, but do you know what the fuck this is all about? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I have no idea what it's about. He said, well, look, they've said to me, I can go and see the first episode. It was very early in the morning. He said, go and have another breakfast. So I had another breakfast. Anyway, he came back and I said, do you, you know what it's about? He said, I have the foggiest idea what it's about. So when I'm doing the, the, you know, the episode and McGowan comes up to me in a rage. He says, you're playing it for comedy. He said, you're looking like you don't know what's going on. And I said, <laughs> do I not know what's going on? <laughs> The director doesn't know what's going on, or the unit have got no idea what the fuck's going on, and what is more, you don't know what the fuck is going on, and if you think I'm going to play someone who knows what's going on when he doesn't know what's going on, go fuck yourself, and he walked <laughs> off, so we were not the best of friends. Oh, yeah, good, you're, you're another one in the crew. After that, George Markstein walked out of the series, and also he said, look, I want you to play the lead in Special Branch. And people often say, why were there no more episodes of Prisoner? Mm. It was because he was around the twist. And the great organization told me we've had enough of him. They, they canceled the show. Mm. That's the true story. <laughs> and of course, I, you, know, I, you know he was one of the people that was asked to play James Bond. But it was only a small British picture. James Bond was only a small British picture. But you know, McGowan wouldn't touch a woman. He wouldn't have anything to do with women. He wouldn't kiss a woman. He wouldn't cuddle a woman. All the girls who played in in the prisoner say, oh, he was woo. So he, he turned Absolutely. it down. Yeah. And yeah. Ian Henry, do you remember Ian Henry? Oh, I worked with Ian Henry many times. Ian Henry was offered it. And he was so drunk, he hadn't read it and turned it down. Well, he and Patrick would have been good together in terms of the drinkings. Well, exactly, exactly. In fact, I went to ATV and there was Ian Henry and the guy who was in the Where He Goes There with me. Oh, I forget his name now. And they said, hello, Darren, and they all fell down the stairs. <laughs> on the floor. But I, I actually helped Ian... We were working on something and I helped him several times and forced him. We were on location and we'd had lunch and we had to drive to the other location. And along the way, he said, can we stop here, please, to the driver? And I said, why, Ian, why are we stopping? He said, just pop in for a drink. I said, no, you don't. And he said, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. Drive on. I mean, he did manage to get one drink. And I said, you better not, just take it easy, take it easy. You know, we're on Where Eagles Stare with Richard Burton. He yes, was sir. four bottles of vodka a day. I know Richard Burton too. <laughs> uh, yeah. In fact, my agent said, we're going to do this film, uh, Where Eagles Stare. And I said, I want, a, I want a daily rate. And they said, you won't make so much money on a daily rate. You know, this is a picture deal is much better. But I was in the old Vic with Richard Burton in about 1880. He was pissed then. So I said, no, I want a daily rate. So I was on a daily rate for about four months. Richard, have another drink. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. I nearly worked on Where Angels Dare. Did you? Yes, I, I went up for the, not the Mary Ewell part, the other one, the other woman. Um, and I did a test and I was told the director really liked my performance and then I didn't get it and I know reason why. Um, and then East, um, Clint Eastwood, I met him not very long after that at a party. I didn't meet him, I was sitting there, he happened to be at the party, he came up to me and he said, I saw your test and it was by far the best. He was I, a nice man. I didn't get it, so we both knew why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you remember um, Burton was going, made a film about the Crays, the Cray brothers, after their Eagles Dare, and Elliot Kasner said to me, Darren, we want you to be play the Crays in this little British picture, because Elizabeth Taylor, they wanted for, oh, what was it? They wanted her for a picture, which she did with um, Michael Caine. And uh, Richard, she said, well, I can't work unless Richard works. And Elliot Kastner says, well, I've got no movies except a little English picture. Um, and so he played the part that I was supposed to play. <laughs> Such is life. Such is life. Such is life. It's a funny old game. Uh -huh. Funny old game. <laughs> Um, well, uh, Darren mentioned uh, the director, Robert, Robert Asher. Do you remember uh, Robert Asher, Annette? Say again? Oh, do you remember the, the director, Robert Asher? Oh, yes. Robert Asher, yeah. I loved him. He was a yeah. sweet man. I know. He, he was lovely. You know, he said, I have got no idea what the fuck this is all about. I know. But a few, when I came into my episode and Patrick was so bloody mean, you know, I, I, did, I did the scene with my father, the watchmaker. Yeah. And Patrick was watching a bit of it. We must have filmed the first bit and then he's in it. Um, and when I left, he was waiting outside, like as we came off. It. And as I passed him, he said, I suppose you think that was good, did you? I said, yes, I did actually, the final take, yeah. Well, I'm glad I said to him, you, you know, go fuck yourself in front of you. The same day, Darren, I don't know, I'm sure you would remember if you were there at the time. <coughs> Dear Robert Asher, whom, who um, Patrick had asked him to come and direct some of them, because he liked him very much. He, Patrick was on the What's It that day, and um, at, at a scene in the afternoon when uh, Bob Asher criticized something that he'd done in the scene. Patrick just lost it. He called Robert, called Bob every name under the sun in front of the whole crew, everybody, just, I mean, annihilated him. Bob just got up, walked out and never came back. And for that, I could never forgive anybody. Well, he, was a, he, he was, basically, he was an asshole. Um, mm. And, um, I mean, he was round the twist. Everybody, the whole unit said he's off his head, he's off his rocker. Oh, yeah. You know as well as I know that anybody with real talent doesn't behave like that. You know, let's put it this way. He was not burdened with the great talent. Yeah. I mean, I made films with Frank Sinatra. And I mean, what a gentleman. You know, what a gentleman. Oh. You know, uh, no, we didn't like him. And nobody else liked him. No, I know he wasn't, but particularly women. There was a, I, I remember even talking with Barbara Murray once and, Mar and Barbara, Barbara yeah. she, was, she was a really tough lady. You know, I liked her, but she was a bit, <laughs> um, and we were talking, she'd done Danger Man, not, not Prisoner. And she said to me, oh, my God, she said, I was terrified of him. Can you imagine Barbara Murray being terrified mm -hmm. of anyone? I did a few danger mans with him, I think. But Roger Moore, for instance, what a nice man. Oh, well, Roger's a gentleman. He was a, he was a patron of my company when he was, was alive. But you know something? I must tell you this story because this must not be forgotten. Now, I've known him 
my family had known him, so I'd known him for years and years and years. So it wasn't really like, you know, two actors. And we're sitting at uh, one of the studios there, and he was doing one, you know, the same. And it was a beautiful summer day, and we were sitting out there and uh, waiting for the lighting. And we're sitting there, and he's, after a while, he said, you know something, Darren? I said, well, what? He said, I'm very handsome. And I thought, oh, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, you are very handsome. I know what you're going to say. And then, and then he waited for a long time. And then he said, you know something, Darren, I'm very tall. And I said, y yes, uh, you, you are, you're very, very tall. And I thought, this is very strange. And while he turned around and he said, you know something, Darren? I said, no. He said, one day they're going to find out I can't fucking act. I know, I know. I knew what you were going to say. It must be. I knew, I knew um, Roger, not just working with him. He was, we were great friends for years and years. You know, my husband knew him and everything. And um, he, he, he said that to me a few times. Oh, yeah, I said, I can't act, you know, but I, I get away with it. <laughs> I love, I love Everyone knows I love Roger. He was married to Dorothy Squires, which was, you know, my, my father, who wasn't really my father, were the biggest stars in the world in 1928. And they were big stars until they retired, earning a fortune, I might add. And so I knew Dorothy Squires. What a monster. Yeah. My goodness. And there was a rumor that he used to pay her a fortune never to write her autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like he was my, he, he was <laughs> sort of, I met Dorothy Squires too. I, I was on a show with her. Well, I, I, you know, I'd been with my family with Dorothy Squires and I thought, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh, fun and games. Was quite nice to me. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, she... Very young. I was very young. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, she wasn't rude or anything, but she was a virago, you know, I mean, God, you, you know, who... Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I saw her working. <laughs> she was a big star, big star, big star. Should we get on with it with the prisoner? Oh, yes, I was going to say, um, we just saw a scene uh, a, few a few minutes ago, Darren, with... Uh, the gentleman who played the butler, um, Angelo Muscat. Do you remember Angelo at, at all? Yes, vaguely, vaguely. Hmm. The, um, a, a, a nice man, approachable? No, oh, everybody was nice except McGowan. So everyone, everyone was okay apart from... Uh, the, I mean, the, the number league. one I'd worked with for years and years and years, the number one assistant director, he couldn't hmm. stand him. Hmm. Absolutely hated him. And you know, a unit... <laughs> Never hate anybody. They're mm. so work, you know, they're hundred percent professional. You know, they don't hate, but none of them liked him. Yeah. Mm. yeah. How did you get on with Alexis Kana? Fine. Yeah, he was he was okay. Yeah, yeah fine, fine. Because I asked him too, did he know what it was about? He said, no, absolutely. But not. George Monstein was the creator of it. Yes. <laughs> and he walked, he walked out of it because there was a lot of talk about him being involved with the Secret Service. And he said, well, I'm doing this thing. It's about a retirement home for spies. And that was the basic thing for the, but he couldn't stand him. He walked out. And as I said, the great organization wouldn't, wouldn't do another series. Hmm. So it wasn't Patrick's idea. No way. Oh. No way, George Monkstein. He was, he, you know, he was the creator of Special Branch. Yeah. And I only did two, two series of that because otherwise you'd be typecast and, and all that sort of thing. And he was involved with the Secret Service at some point or other uh, because Special Branch wanted to know where we got some of the stories from. And so George, it was George's idea about the prisoner and, and everything. Because oh, I, you know, in recent times, I've thought about what it was about. And uh, I thought to myself, well, in a way, I can see this uh, 
what you can see behind it, which is that it could foresee uh, a country becoming like the, the a Russian thing, where you're, or, or Chinese, where you have to wear the same things more or less, where you're all punished or not for doing things, you're kept at a level and you're not asked, except for the ones up there. And I thought, oh, actually, maybe there was some futuristic about it that this person, mm -hmm. you know, I thought it was Patrick. I thought maybe it was not all bad. Yeah, right. And but um but one of the great failings nothing was, like that at all. Where did where did all these number twos come from? Where well, I don't know, there were a lot of them, and I wondered why they're all number two. You know, and I think number really, three. Because every number three? Number three, God knows who were number three. <laughs> no, there was, I was 50. I was number 50. Who knows? But I think because nobody knew what it was all about, everybody was trying to figure out something or other, and uh, everybody's got their own idea or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, it's lasted for look how long. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, it's very, in America, I mean, it was very popular. Yeah, look, look. I was surprised, you know, they imagine you and Leslie Gray turning it down and saying we don't want anything to do with them. You know, whether or not it's making money or not, life is too short. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think it was one of the most expensive series I think was being made in the UK at, at the time, considerably more than the, the Saint and the, the Avengers. But of course, it was making it back because it was so popular. So the only reason, of course, why I didn't continue it was because of those relationships. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark Eden has has arrived on on, on the scene. Um, do you do you, do you both remember uh, working with Mark? Oh, a good friend of mine. He died recently. He did. Yes. I think he was ninety or. In his nineties, I think. No, yeah. He was a yeah. lovely man. We were great friends. Yeah, I wasn't a friend, but I worked with him a couple of times, and he was very nice. I uh, we got along well. I did um, uh, Marco, not Marco Polo, Doctor Who. In 1823, oh, yeah. everybody was ashamed of being in it because it was a children's program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the man who played Doctor Who, whose name I always forget, was a very famous West End star. And he was very embarrassed to mention. That's on Pertwee? No, no. Uh, he, uh, uh, William Hartnell. William Hartnell. Oh, wow. A very famous West End star. Yeah. And he wouldn't tell anybody because he was working on a, a children's program <laughs> at one of the small studios, uh, not the main studio, the BBC had a small studio. Uh, Lime, Lime Grove. Side of Sh uh, Shepherd's Bush. Hmm. Yeah, I think it was Lime Grove and it was yeah, Studio Lime D, Grove. which is one of the worst studios you could possibly make anything in. <clears throat> yep, yep, and, and uh, Warris Hussein said he wanted a, uh, Lemko, little and lovely little actor, wanted a monkey on his shoulder, and that's a great idea. But unfortunately, the monkey <laughs> got so frightened he jumped off, went into the gantry, and had diarrhea. And of course, <laughs> in, in those days, you couldn't stop the tape. <laughs> and so I'd be being a set with Mark Eden, you know, with all the blooming hair and everything. We're doing this thing, and I'm bloop, bloop. You know. It didn't make them right for having a poor little monkey and performing. So there's what I did. I had to bring the, the uh, fire brigade in to get it out, the poor thing, because yeah. no one could get him out. Yeah. So when you see Warris, remind him of that. <laughs> I, I, I will, yes. Um, he, yes, Mark Eden played Mark the, the Marco Polo in, in, in that um, story, which is sadly, sadly missing. And that's why the they were all destroyed, because nobody thought to keep them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw a message a little while ago from Rick Davy. Oh, yeah. He's looking. Uh, in. I'll Hello, have, Rick. I'll have a look at the, the message in a, in, in a moment or two. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so this question, question, well, I've got a question from Stephen that's popped up. Uh, this is for Annette. Um, as an Australian uh, international like yourself, now living in the UK, he was curious when you were acting in in in, in the UK in the sixties and seventies. Did you um, 
have to put on the English accents? Were you, was that something you were concerned with? Do you have a dialect coach, anything of that nature? No, we didn't seem to have dialect coaches then. I could have done with one hmm. occasionally. Um, no, I just, uh, I would find people with those accents. Like once I had to be Romanian. Hmm. And I thought, God, Romanian. And I searched around. I found a shop girl, a shop woman in, in a store. And I said, what accent is that? I, and she said, oh, I'm Romanian. I said, good, talk to me, will you? <laughs> I said, I need to know the accent. And we talked for quite a while, which was good. <laughs> yeah, no, I just either, you know, made it up or crossed my fingers, hope to the best. One does. When I did that film with Sinatra, I met him. And I said, good morning, mister. He said, you're not a kraut. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm an Englishman. Mm. He said, I, I thought you were a crowd. I said, no. He said, you're going to be a crowd in my, in my movie. <laughs> you see where he was there, I think. Mm. So I was German. Did you always find um, accents, Darren, quite easy to pick up? Or yeah, did you? Not, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Not too bad. I must tell you a story. The great organization said, we're going to do a play. You're going to be in a, a West End play. Uh, and we rehearse on Monday, and this was Friday. He said, you were playing an Irishman. I said, I don't know how to do an Irish accent. He said, well, get a record. So all weekend, I'm on this record with this Irish accent, and we have the read-through. And they're all Irish actors, except Michael Craig. They're all Irish, and it was written by a young Irishman, too, who won an award. And I'm so nervous, you know, with this Irish accent. And after the read-through, he says, Darren, so I wonder if I could have a little word with you. And I went, oh, shit. And he said, your accent. I said, I know. I'm awfully sorry. I didn't know anything about an Irish accent. And I, he said, no. He said, your accent's fine. It's County Cork. I want County Derry. I said, you're lucky it's anywhere near. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> it's quite different, isn't it? Uh, and they hated him. Brendan Ben hated him. His brother hated him. On the first night, <laughs> I walk on the stage with mad Irish sons, mad Irish sons. I walk on the stage, I lift up a sofa. I was younger. And I ripped off my shirt. I was younger. Pushed it on the floor. And someone out in the gallery said, it's fucking rubbish. And it was the guy who hated the author. And I thought, I haven't said anything yet. Where do you go from this? And they dragged him out. This was the first night at the Apollo. <laughs> um, Stephen also asked uh, Annette whether you remember um, the Australian set episode of, of, of The Saint that was supposed to be in the Outback, but of course would have been uh, Elstie. I do. Uh, <clears throat> I do. Hmm. And um, one of the things uh, about that was that, um, oh, who directed it? I knew him really well. Um, gosh. Well, everybody, everybody knows, please put it on the, in, in the chat and I'll... Uh, yeah, I, I worked with him several times. I'd met him in Australia, actually, and he was a lovely man. But he kept shouting at me, for God's sake, be Australian. I said, I can't. He said, but you are Australian. I said, yes, I know, but I don't like the accent. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, I want to ask, uh, Darren, in, in, the, in the beginning of the episode, um, the, um, a gentleman called Peter Swanwick is the, plays the supervisor. Do you have any memories of, of, of He's Peter a at all? Sweet guy. Sweet guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe he was sweet. Hmm. Yeah, nice fellow. Oh, good, good. Um, and did you have any more memories of, of Mark Eden, Annette, that you wanted to, to, to mention? Well, I worked with him other times too. I think he was very distracted. You know, we had a couple of conversations. I didn't really get to see anyone very much except hmm. for Patrick, because my scenes were with Patrick or Martin Milner who was a lovely man, Patrick mm. gave him hell. Um, and, um, well, what was, it, what, was it, what was I answering? 
Oh, oh um, memories of Mark. Oh, yes, yes. So I, you know, I talked with him, but I think Mark was a bit, you know, he was a bit frazzled by the whole thing. Mm. And he wasn't really in a chatty mood. We talked, we worked on a couple of other things. I, don't ask me what, I can't remember. <laughs> but he was always just lovely, really kind man. Mm. And a very, very competent actor. You know, mm. he was really good. I was really upset when I heard he died. Yeah. <laughs> yes, mm. I was hoping to have seen him again, you know. Mm. I did. I did hear in the the end at the end of the episode there was a fight between Mark and and Patrick, and I did did read that apparently Patrick was really going for him, you know. So I think Mark's a little bit, yeah, bit frightened. Yeah, you're right. I think I do yeah. remember. I didn't speak to. It's lucky he didn't go for me. <laughs> I did a film with Stanley Baker, and he was another asshole, and he kept on hitting me. In this, uh, you know, jujitsu thing. Oh, oh! And I thought, well, I'm going to hit him back. <laughs> so I did, mm. and he collapsed. He didn't like it very much. Yeah. Sorry, Stanley. I didn't mean to hit you, like you've been hitting me. <laughs> I just saw a question saying, Annette, did you enjoy working on? And then it was nothing more. What is it? You know. Uh, the new Avengers, but I did want to talk to you separately about that, perhaps. But if you, um, if, if that's okay, um, uh, you just there's just been a scene now with, with where number six confronts you, Darren, about the the the, the assassination attempt, and you 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 um you, of course you're recording it to then use uh, against him later on. I was wondering about your 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 costume, Darren, and also particularly you, 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 the lovely <coughs> bit of business with the glasses that you use throughout the episode. Uh, uh, how much of 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 your character, your personality, were you able to bring into your wardrobe and little things like with your with your glasses? Well, usually one one did a, a great deal, but I mean, I think if you see the series or the the episode, I'm totally confused by everything. Mm. I use the glasses as uh, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I've got no idea. Mm. So uh, I think the the uh, costume was a you couldn't change the costume. I think it was a it was inherited. A, yes, mm. mind you, a special branch. One could do whatever one wanted. How mm. many episodes were you in, Darren? Because I didn't see the whole thing. Which one of what special? Uh, the prisoner. No, only one. one. Oh, only yeah. the one. He wouldn't have it. He would a. He wouldn't have me. And and b. I thought it was a, a for a few episodes and ongoing, but no. No, no. He wouldn't have me in. Oh, so that was you out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they said no. Wait a minute. He's going to be. In, he's in this episode. You know whether you like it or not. He's in this episode. The mm. great said. Mm. I was waiting for you to blow up. Mm. In fact, I thought, I wonder if he's arranged this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, whoops. I didn't know the gun was loaded. Yes, exactly. It's <laughs> 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 funny. Yeah. And I was wondering, uh, Annette, what you thought of, of your, your costume, looking at it again, and the, the white um, hat you have, and the the striped um, top. Oh, God, it was you... awful. Mm. Absolutely awful. And everybody else had the same. I did have a sense of how horrible it must be to be within a community of people where you all wear and look exactly the same. Mm. And I thought it's so claustrophobic uh, and unsettling. There was that. Um, you look around and everybody's wearing these caps and the numbers and stripes and everything and these terrible cloaks we had to wear. Um, it was a little bit, and this is getting off the thing a bit, but mm. I also, I did episodes in um, Prisoner, the Australian prison, women's prison thing. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah. Which was, I hated every minute, but it, the set, everything in the studio, the sets were built into the studio. So you've got mm -hmm. prisons and a room in the prison and the office and all of that. 
And the green room, which was where we went, of course, to have coffee mm. at least, looked exactly like all the other rooms. Yeah. And mm. it was, oh, I hated it. Yeah. You felt you were in a prison the whole time. Mm. And mm. I think with the prisoner, they, that sense came through quite a bit. Mm. You mm. know, with the, the similarity, the sameness, the, yeah. that constant mm. constance of, of sameness was... Mm -hmm. I mean, Darren, did you quite like the, your the main set that you worked in the control room? It's from a design point of view, it's 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 rather lovely. Did you did you like the the, the set where you were mostly in? A set is a set. Mm. Just don't bump into the furniture. Yes. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know set can really. Mm either um, enhance your performance or not, you're fighting with it. Mm. A set can be really problematical if it isn't, if you don't feel it's to do with your, what you're trying to do, be it against or, before, or, or with. Mm. But the atmosphere of the set, I think, is compelling. What do you think, Darren? Do you find it? Absolutely. I know that with, with uh, Dirk Bogard on Victim, um, the number one had a nervous breakdown. Never heard of such a thing. And he took over and calmed the whole set. You know, took over and lovely man calmed it all. And from then on, it was a, a, a good feeling. Right. You know, and yeah, that can happen. That good can feeling happen. Because number one was actually not a very well man. But it is, it, it's very important to have a calmness. Mm. And also, you know, to have a director who calms. Oh, yes. And, and, and if you're playing opposite, you know, somebody, again, that's so important. You know, the rapport between everybody is so important. Um, I want to mention, uh, Darren, because I think it's really good. Your when you're on the phone with Number One in a couple of scenes, and yeah. and how you do play up the, the comedy aspect of it. And it I think again, comedy. it was because yes, didn't know what yeah. the fuck was yeah. going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea, yeah. and that's why <clears throat> you're playing it for comedy. Mm. No, I think it works really well because compared to, I think you're probably one of the more char charismatic of the Number Twos, and I think. It's because of that sort of... Well, I mean, it, yeah. it, you can't play a scene or anything if you don't know what's going on. The only way you can do it is to play it like you don't know what's going on. Mm. Yeah. You yeah, know, right. but he dare, McGowan wouldn't dare cross me again. <laughs> well, hey, because of the great organisation, <laughs> I didn't give a shit. <laughs> whether I did a prisoner or not. Hmm. And neither of you encountered him later in, in, in life at all. Was this kind of your last involvement with, with Patrick? I had nothing to do with him. No. Hmm. Um, uh, just a bit of trivia for those that are watching along. Um, earlier in the episode, there's a computer assistant who works out the, um, number six's schedule so that Darren's character can, can plant the, uh, the the watch that is broken. And that's a lady called Wanda um, uh, uh, Venham. And she um, is the mother of Benedict Cumberbatch, just for those that might want to, 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 to know that. Um, uh, we did see um, a scene earlier with Ch Ch Charles Lloyd Peck, who... Um, Oh yes, uh, Pat, who um, of course um, Roger Lloyd Pat's uh, father. I I, I, it. I I destroyed him in victim. I broke up his hairdressing shop opposite the the um, Palace Theatre, and I said to him because he was such a sweet man. I said mm. I'm going to be very very unkind to you. I'm going to be very nasty. Please mm. don't take it. <laughs> and so I smashed up the whole place and poor guy. <laughs> My God. No, he was a sweet man. He was. He was a sweet man. Sweet man. Yeah. Somebody was sweet. Yeah. So, generally speaking, the assholes were very few and far between. Mm. Yeah, they were. Yeah. I think. 
Yeah, yeah they were. They were more good. Yeah. I mean, they were very talented too. Of course. You know, oh, very yeah. talented. Oh yeah, absolutely. So many good character actors there were. So England, many. I think is absolutely, or, or certainly was, absolutely the top for character actors. Yeah. You know, in America, character actors are different. There were and have been a few. Yeah. But on the whole, they're not strong there. No. England I, is the great. The 30s they were. Hmm? Some of the people in the 1930s in American films, they kept on coming up as character, but remarkable character. Oh, there was there were some, and in that time, yeah, and then it drifted off. And in modern times, like when I've been living over there, um, character actors you sort of never saw. No, almost, you know. No. And I used to say, God, that that part should be with a with a character actor, mm. you know. And and also, of course, the actors aren't given a chance. Mm. to play character roles, because as you get older, the only thing you can play, really, mm. are character roles. Yeah. Um, is anybody out there going to give me a character role? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't do this anymore. Although, th th this young man called Jamie Patterson said, I've written a film for you, and I thought, oh my God, oh dear. And he said, um, I said, what do I do? He said, you play a drag queen and a crossdresser. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it's won 14 international film awards. <laughs> and when we went to LA, it won the top two awards. And Jamie Patterson, who was sort of bumming it around Brighton, was signed by one of the biggest agents in Hollywood and had just flown over to Hollywood to direct a big movie. Isn't mm. it a funny business? Yes, mm. it is. So for years, you know, teaching, doing this, and it couldn't get anywhere. This little film, it's on prime television. You just never know. It's, it's, a, it's a, a life of surprises. Total. Hmm. Total. Hmm. But it's on, it's on prime television, tucked. You know, I, they tuck yeah. their balls in. But it's, it's a beautiful movie. It's a beautiful movie. Hmm. The last one I'll ever make. I'll, I'll look out for it. Oh, it's a beautiful movie. And, you know, Jamie, he's been signed by the biggest agency in Hollywood. Mm. He won both top awards when we were there. Wonderful. And we were sitting yeah. in the audience and they said, the runner-up is tucked. And he turned around to me and he said, did they just say tucked? I said, yes. He said, did we just win? I said, we bet, yes, you, you won, go up. And we went up and then came down again. <laughs> the winner is tucked. And he said, did they just say that? I said, yes, you won. <laughs> you won the top two. Lovely guy, talented, <clears throat> very talented. Funny game, funny game. It is, it is, but it's exciting. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, as, as actors, do you ever really retire or is, is it always kind of, if something no, comes in, you will go back I'm out? No. I mean, they've got me in Wikipedia as retired. I got very angry, so I'm have, going to have it changed. Mm. Um, no, you never retire. Because if something happens and comes up, you say, yes, absolutely, mm. I'm there. And there was a young man who saw Tucked and he said, ah, can I be your manager? I said, yeah, be my manager. So anyway, so he keeps on saying, they want you for this, they want you for that. And no, oh, right, fine, you know, fine. So, I mean, I'm so ancient now, but I mean, I run this company just to, uh, you know, just for the fun of it. I've always been involved in companies because I don't know if you remember um, a company called Our Price Records. Yeah. Well, I think we had 200 shops and I started that with my little brother. I don't remember that. Oh, it was about 200. <laughs> 200 record shops, our price records. Hmm. Again, fun and games. <laughs> is, is it part, part of it, Darren, that part, as a, a part of an actor's life, because it's sometimes not of the most dependable, 
industry in terms of you know money coming in do you kind of always want to have another feather to your cap in terms of something else you can sort of do perhaps when the work is not so, so much there well i was very lucky man hmm. um i know it's not probably good to say it but um i never needed to work or struggle or do that i was hmm. very fortunate in fact, I wrote a song, and that's how our prize record started, because my father wouldn't talk to me. As I said, he wasn't really my father. Anyway, he said, what do you think of this song? Because he was in publishing and goodness knows what else. And I said, oh, it's rubbish, just for fun. And, you know, and he said, well, do you, can you write a song better? And I said, yeah, of course. So I rushed to my little brother and I said, we're going to write the worst song that's ever been written. <laughs> and so we wrote it in 20 minutes. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I handed it to my father and I said, there it is. And I thought he'd laugh. He never did. And we went, he said, get in the car. We're going to, I've sold your song. And I went, oh my, no, no, no. He said, get in the car. We're going. And it was written, sung by Adam Faith, whose uh, first song was, what do you want if you don't want money? And my song is on the B side. And we sold a million copies. Oh, wow. And, and Bill Kenwright, probably my, my closest friend, can still sing the lyrics to embarrass me. <laughs> we wrote it in 20 minutes in hysteria. Hmm. Now until forever. So I was very lucky. A, my family was very well off, you know. My father only drove Rolls Royces when he didn't drive Rolls Royces. <laughs> He couldn't drive, and I had to drive them. In fact, I used to arrive at Rado with a Rolls Royce, and people used to say, we can't understand that. I said, it's not my car. It's not my car. So my, you know, they've been stars since 1928. You know, what the hell, what the hell? So no, I was very lucky, man. Hmm. Um, uh, Mine's a different story. <laughs> I was always wondering where the next penny was coming from, for a while, anyway. I know, I know. Yeah. But now I want to be in it for the for the fun. I'm just lucky. I just want to do it. Yeah. It's something you have to do. You don't want to do it. You have to do it. Because mm. I mean, they were musical stars. And when I said I wanted to be an actor, it was something like being a prostitute. <laughs> but, well, I never found that. See, I had a whole different... I started in ballet, so... All oh, right. You know, I had a, a leg up there. And then you just went into it and it was never, I missed all that bit of, oh, you tart or whatever. You know. I didn't know you were Australian. Yes. Born there and came over when I was 22. Really? Jumped on a ship and came over. Um, I could afford the worst cabin on the ship, which was next downstairs next to the boiler room. Yeah. With three other girls in there, four of us stuck in bunks. But it you were so hot. Brave to come over. Yeah, well, I wanted to. I had no other way. I just, right. I was working in the theatre in radio, this was out in Australia, and some television, and working as a waitress at supper at, at times when as soon as, as I could, and I saved all my tips and got the cheapest <laughs> thing. I, I never knew I went, that. went to Rome. I never knew that. And I jumped off the ship in Rome. And I actually, I didn't know when I started on the trip, but during it, my mother sent me a letter and said, oh, this guy that I'd known for a long time, just a friend, you know, he's in Rome, he's heard you're coming over. He's got a, an apartment and he said, you can share it there. Really? I walked into Rome, into this wonderful apartment on the, the sixth floor in the oldest um, Via, Via Giulia, which is one of the oldest streets in Rome, <laughs> on the top floor, and it had a, a terrace around three sides of it. Ah, beautiful. You saw the seven hills of Rome. You had grapevines hanging down. <laughs> we had two, <laughs> we had to share a bedroom. I mean, there was no romance with us at all. We had to share a bedroom. There's only one bedroom, a couple of beds and one bedroom. Yeah. No hot water. <laughs> running cold water and for a shower it had that they had a loo on the um terrace and you went in there but also 
there was a cork in the wall. So when you wanted to shower, you stripped off, you took the cork out, you went, oh, ooh, yeah. And then you put it back in while you soaked all over and then you took it out again and to hope to get the soap off before the tank went oh, in. You couldn't make a move. walked out and sunbathed to dry off. It, it was heaven. And at one point I met, um, uh, oh, Howard Duff and, and oh. his wonderful wife. Oh yes, I can't remember her name. Yes, so famous. Yes. She was a brilliant actress. Uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, they, we became very friendly with them. And they came up, we said, we're going to have a bit of a party, come up. And you had to walk up the stairs. And the last lot to our floor was like a ladder. And you popped up and opened the door. And she, I opened the door and she's standing there going, <gasps> by the Lupino. Oh, that's right. The and she's saying, oh, do you have a time? I said, yes. I said, come in. And she walked in and she looked and she went, oh, oh my God, now I know why you want to live here. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. Yeah, yeah. She was a wonderful. I just, I thought she was absolutely terrific. The Lupino family. I lost touch with her, unfortunately. The Lupino family were, so many were very famous, uh, the Lupinos. Yes. The Lupino yes. family, yeah. yes. She was very intelligent. Oh. Highly intelligent. Mm. No, fascinating story. Yeah, it is good. <laughs> so much. I wanted to mention to both of you, uh, we, we touched on him in brief, but, but Martin Miller, who played the, the watchmaker, so played your your father in it, uh, Annette. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps, start, perhaps the start of, of Annette's memories, but what was it like to, uh, working with Martin? Oh, he was, gosh, he was such a lovely man. I mean, a really lovely man, but he was getting, he was getting quite old at the time. And he did have problems with remembering the lines. So we had a lot of cuts mm. and that annoyed Patrick, as you can imagine. Mm. And he got irritated with my sister. <clears throat> he's doing, he's very good. He's fine. Leave him alone. Mm. And um, uh, he was just, he was just a lovely man. I think, I think I worked with him in something else too. He was just one of those old, very reliable actors who gave a good performance. And you bumped into in films and things and- Yes. Oh, hi, yeah. how are you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was. We, I've worked as you have, Darren, with just some of the most wonderful people. Yeah. You know, and they can be bit part actors or they can be stars or they can be that wonderful sort of working actor yeah. who does everything um and i rarely found anybody who really riled me up no i agree i totally agree mm. stanley baker was an asshole and mcgowan was mm. yeah mm. i could name a couple of others too but i can't remember their names now mm. but those who are not burdened with talent <laughs> You think a lot of it stems from insecurity, sort of things, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're, they're, yeah. Absolutely. The ones who are secure, you know, why be an asshole? You know, it's a great art. It's a wonderful art. Yes, it is. And uh, yeah, some are not nice. Well, very few. Hmm. Um, I, I was wondering whether uh, you had any more me memories of Martin Miller, uh, Darren, because of course you had worked. With Martin Miller in Marco Polo, the Doctor Who. Yeah. He'd been a couple of episodes of, of, of that. Was there any anything that Annette hasn't mentioned that you'd like to mention about Martin? Well, he was just he, he was just fun, very handsome man. Mm -hmm. And I think we did the Adventures one of them, Adventures of Sir Lancelot, I think. Um, no, he was a lovely man. And we had long chats, laughing chats, mm -hmm. you know, gay times really. I'm not sure whether he was English. My feeling always was that he came sure. from somewhere. I'm not sure. No, but I, I have a feeling that he was um, from somewhere else mm. and came to England probably many years before. Mm. But he had the, yeah. I don't know, he just had that sort of um, something that, that made him 
not foreign, but someone different to British. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah I don't know. Yeah. I was married to an Australian. You were? Yeah. I usually collapse at the moment like this. But um, I was walking, I divorced her, and I was walking along, and you know one of these vans with blood and all the rest of it? Hmm. And a woman came up to me and said, have you given blood? <laughs> Australian accent and I can't do it. And I said, oh yes, I have. Given blood, that's was, what she says. I was married to an Australian. <laughs> they didn't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, that was a disaster. Many, yes, I, would, I would never. I think I, I think I left Australia, not just for my career, but to escape the men. Yeah, well, I went to Australia first when I was 14 because um, I left school and they said, well, we could bribe Dover College, but um, my family were going to Australia and Africa and, and everything. And they said, well, would you like to come with us? And I actually was insistent. And so at 14, we went to Africa, to India, and all over Australia, mm. you know, um, in the the William Circuit, I think. Oh, yeah. the William Circuit. I work, yes, J.C. Williams, Williamson, J.C. Williamson. And I, the only job I've ever had in my life was in Melbourne, where I was in the dispatch department of Universal, because I was so bored, and I was the only person ever fired because they would hire kangaroos then. <laughs> because, you know, the, anyway, that's another story which I will not go into here, but... Um, Actually, I, I, I'll go back slightly on my, what I said, you know, to escape the men. There are some lovely men out there and very intelligent and interesting people, but a lot of them are not. But it's a beautiful country. Oh, the country is gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, really beautiful. Yeah, and when I married this woman, we lived in Lismore, yeah, uh, a thousand kilometers north, and we had cattle and everything, you know. Yeah. And riding, I used to love that. And yeah. unfortunately, it wasn't a very good association, mm. to put it mildly. That's another story, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is horrendous. But um, we have a question from a, a gentleman called Sebastian came in. Um, um, we've covered a lot of it, so I'll, I'll rephrase it slightly, but what was it like shooting at Elstree for both of you? Did you like Elstree as a, as a studio? Where? Uh, Elstree, Boringwood. Oh, Elstree. Yeah. God, I spent 12, 12 years of my life at Elstree. Yeah. I loved Elstree. Yeah, well, it became it's... sort of home in a way. Yeah, Pinewood was the same, Shepparton was the same. And yeah, Pinewood I liked. Pinewood was nice. Mm. Yeah. And Shepparton, I only worked a little bit there, but I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, Elstree, I was more familiar with than any of them. Mm -hmm. They just did so many things there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, I just, just knew it. Now, of course, I've been down, you know, in recent times. God, it's nothing. It's nothing there. No, yeah, well, it's all location. It's amazing. They're using it, but I, it's not like it was. No, it's all basically location now. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, would you both have liked to have gone on, on location? Because, of course, it has a wonderful, the village is a wonderful location, but of course, neither of you went uh, went on location. Well, I think they only did some stock shots of the before. Yeah, no one worked there. Down hmm. there, and no one else went no. down there. Hmm. Just some stock no shots. No one went there. Hmm. But I used to like going on location. I used to say to the location manager, look, <laughs> you're going to spend so much money on a five-star American hotel, give me the money and I'll find my own hotel. Yeah. Because yeah. I would find, you know, a beautiful, like for instance, in Salzburg, the Goldner Hirsch had been a hotel for 800 years. And so, you know, one stayed there and not at the Osterreicherhof, which is everywhere in Europe, there was an Osterreicherhof. Um, I was yeah. wondering whether um, if you had any any memories of any more of the the crew that worked on on the prisoner, for example, um, Brendan uh, uh, Stafford, the cinematographer. Whether 
anybody oh, sort of left impression on you like, like, like him? Well, I think the main impression one mm. got in those days of a unit, mm. the number one, the number two, were superb workmen. They were absolutely amazing. They, whether or not the, whether or not you could film it within five days was dependent upon them. Yes. Their total professionalism. Yeah. You know, the number one I'd known for many, 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 many years. Mm. And when I told Patrick, <laughs> when I told Magoo and go fuck yourself, he went. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah, I did. I'd worked with him before, too. Yeah. I, there were some of the uh, cameramen who were just. Uh, oh, superb, superb. Absolutely superb. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And the crews, the crews were nice. Amazing. Yeah, they really were. Yeah. And a Roger early on had given me some good advice. And he said, you know, particularly when he knew I was going to do Randall and Hopkirk. And he said to me, just, just listen for a little minute. I said, of course, what? He said, never lose your temper, control, and just, we'll work it out. You just work it out. He said, because the crews are normally wonderful. And he said, you need your crews on your side. And it's true, you needed them. And when you treated them well, as I did pretty much all the time, I mean, I didn't, don't remember anyone who was awful. I, um, I produced, directed a movie for the fun of it called The Amorous Milkman. And I got all the crew that I knew and at the end of the first week, I had a drinks table and food. And I said, chaps, thank you so much for all your hard work, because the money is mine. <laughs> Please enjoy, have a drink on me. You know, have you know, a meal and everything. With Diana Dawes, funnily enough. Um, and they, they were amazing. Because in those days, you know, you weren't supposed to move a chair. Someone else was supposed to move the chair if you weren't the one who was supposed to move oh, yeah. the chair. And when after that, oh, they moved the chair and they did everything. Yeah, they would, they would do those things if, if you were if if they working with them well, you know. And, and sometimes they'd say, um, you know, it was going overtime. And they'd say, oh, well, yeah, let's get this one in the... In the yes, so true. You know, right now. Absolutely because true. it's going well, let's just do it. Yeah, and, and I think others, others might cut you off and say, no, we'll come back tomorrow morning. And we're then... talking about Diana Dawes, the first day's filming, um, I sent a car for her and all the rest of it, and she was late. And so I went to see her and I said, hi, Diana. I said, um, you were late. Oh, yeah. I said, Diana, this is my money. And she said, I'll never be late again. <laughs> I'll never be late again. <laughs> way on time. Hmm. Way on time. She's a surprisingly nice woman. I met her only once. Funniest woman I yeah. ever met in my life. Yeah. She had a sense of humor. Yeah. It was hilarious. You know, she would have the, we were in stitches, you know, laugh at this dry humor. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, no, she was very nice, really. Hmm. Yeah. One actor I did want to mention, um, Mark Burns. Did you um, remember Mark Burns at all? Um, yeah, I worked with Mark, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on that particular, on that episode. Hmm. And I forget he was in the, I think he was going to do the Charge of the Life Brigade, I think, afterwards, I think. Hmm. I think he was saying. Yeah. Um, another actor who, who who left us too too soon, and unfortunately. Yes. Mark, Mark Burns, he died quite a while ago, didn't I he? I think so. Yes, yes, he did. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you, Mark, not very well, but I knew him. Yeah. Yeah. Mind you, when you get to my age, everybody's dying. <laughs> um, All the people I knew at Rada, you know, O'Toole, Albert Finney, and God. Frank Finley, mm. oh, so many, so many mm. fun guys, fun guys. Although I was never a drinker, and that probably saved me, because mm. two or three drinks, I'd fall asleep. 
<laughs> at parties, you know, where's <laughs> two glasses and there'd be O'Toole drinking. Hmm. God, if he hadn't drunk, you know, and taken drugs, he probably would have lived to about 180. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> In fact, again, again, you know, I told you my father always had Rolls Royces, which I drove. And we were at a party and I was driving with a load of people, uh, students in Tottenham Court Road when it wasn't a roundabout and a foot came down and I slowly drove past. It was O'Toole who'd fallen asleep on the roof and no one had noticed. <laughs> oh, no one had noticed. <laughs> I pulled up and I said, it's Peter. And I said, does anybody know where he lives? He said, well, he never lived anywhere. So, you know, I said, well, who, who take him for tonight? You know, and so we, we drove to a place off Primrose Hill and the actor would lived in the small little thing and we carried him in and he fell asleep. And the next day I said to the actor, how did it go? He said, great. He woke up in the morning and he said, anybody got a drink? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Because you know he had a Jewish nose and black, brown, curly hair. Hmm. It was all changed. He had the hair straightened and blonded, had the nose taken off. Now I'm Jewish, and he used to say to me, You should have my nose. <laughs> no. I didn't know that about oh, him. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. No, he. We, we we were watching each other at, at, at uh, Raga, and uh, O'Toole was very good in Shakespeare, but not very good in modern plays. Albert Finney was good in modern plays, but not very good on Shakespeare. So we used to watch each other. I won the Kendall and the Forbes Robertson, the Shakespearean, and I think O'Toole won either the year before or the year after the gold medal. So we had great fun. Hmm. Did you ever have a, a particular medium that you preferred working in, Darren? Did you prefer theatre, film? Film. Film, yeah. God, I've done so many plays. Hmm. But film I like. Hmm. But I was never really ambitious. You know, I never really was. Hmm. It all just sort of happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think The Prisoner was quite useful in, in your career? Did, it, did you get a lot of feedback from it? Not at all. Not at all. A lot no. of feedback now. In fact, I was asked many times to go to Port Merion on mm. the, um, you know, they have these. And I thought, well, if I go to Port Merion and tell them the true story, I'll probably not get out alive. But <laughs> I went and they were lovely people. I had great time. Mm. You know, a great time with my wife. It was really nice. They I were, was there too. Hmm? You're in the tape. Yeah. I was there that day. Really? That day. Yes, you were. In the bus ride. That's right. No, which one? The bus ride. The bad bus drive. Yeah. You, we were in the bad one. Yes, I was the one that uh, one earlier, which was okay. Oh. Yeah. Well, no, we, I'd only been down once, and that was not involved with someone of a very strange. Anyway, Thomas, you know Thomas who was taking the bus? He's the young man who said, I want to be your manager. Thomas Bowerman. Mine. Yeah. Hmm. This is mine. Hmm. So, so you guys have, through, thanks to these kind of shows, you, you two have encountered each other at, at, at various autograph events and things of that, of that nature. So you're sort of always weaving in and out of each, each other's careers, it sounds like. Yes, yes. Yeah, you do, actually, now. I mean, <laughs> when we were all working back in the 60s, 70s, even 80s. Yeah, so I like the order. None of, us, none of us ever, ever dreamed that we would still be, well, when I say we would still be going, but the shows would still mm. be going and they, people would be contacting us. We would never. We never had an idea about that. No, it's done. Well, we're there. Watch it for a bit, and then you've forgotten. You know, absolutely. there was no merchandise, merchandising. There was nothing like that, and yet here we are, lasting with this wonderful 
um, album of, of great television. But you know, I do like those autograph things because as you said yourself, I never realized anybody was watching them. Hmm. Yeah, you did, didn't back then, really. And when, you, when you're signing the autographs and people say, oh, you know, when I got back from school, I used to watch you and this, that. Oh, yes, and yes. My mother liked it. And you thought to yourself, well, that's great pleasure. I had no idea that yeah. one was giving any pleasure. Yes. It was a job. This is, this is the joy of it. It really is. It's a job. Mm. And for long, I have to say this. <laughs> it's a little bit of a boost to me, but just in the last month or so, from someone who knew the series, has gone onto my website and has just bought two paintings from me. Really? Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. I thought, oh, good. Yeah. That's wonderful. Keep on painting. Okay. <laughs> uh, We're getting still... away from the prisoner a bit. Oh, no, no, I'm just going to see if we've got any uh, any questions that we haven't already um, covered. Just have a look, look through the the chat. Uh, so as we start to work, wrap up, if anybody's got any last minute questions they want to to ask um, uh, um, my guests, please do um, put them in the in the chat function. Um, I suppose one we have had a, a question about um, Patrick McGoon's relationship with Robert Asher, which, which we've covered. But what did when Robert Asher was fired, was Robert Patrick let let him go? Did either of you end up being directed by by Patrick, or it sounds like he's kind of doing that to you both anyway, really? What do you mean? Um, well, but when Robert Asher went, I take it you 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 probably had finished your scenes by then. The Patrick didn't come in to to direct you at all no i mean i i didn't have what annette had because asher did the whole episode that i was in and mm. i didn't know he even he even came back to do another yeah. one hmm. yeah that was robert asher's last um yeah uh, one and only yeah um, i think he did a lot of comedy films i think asher yes i think he did yeah i think he did a lot of comedy ones i worked with with bob Two or three times. I can't remember the other things. It was one, but I always liked him. We used to sit and have a chat, you know. Yeah. Uh, we had a question from Steve for uh, Annette. Uh, I just wanted to know um, what it's like working with Kenneth on Run Hotcut. Oh, Ken was both of them. I have to say that we were uh, three people who got on like a house on fire. I mm. mean, we just we just really loved each other. We did. Mm -hmm. And I, I had worked with Mike before and I always liked him and thought he was a terrific actor. Mm -hmm. I'd never met Ken, but Ken crept. I still am in touch with Ken every now and again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, I never knew them. Yeah, they're lovely. Yeah, I never knew them. Yeah, they were very nice. People used to come onto our set and say, oh, it's such a nice set to be on. We like this. Mm. It's good. Uh, Kenneth had a question for you, for you Darren. Um, he said, rumour has it you were born at the fin Finsbury Park Empire Theatre. Is that true? Yes, he was. Mm. I was born in the Finsbury Park Empire. I think probably I started at the Finsbury Park Empire mm. and I was finished off somewhere else. Right. <laughs> that, that was mother who I found out had this huge affair with Lou Grade mm. before I was born, you know, because he was a tap dancer and she was a chorus girl. And uh, and then my father in 1928 with his brother, no, he wasn't my father, but in 1928 became the biggest stars in London. Mm. So she went with with Harry and then she went back to Lou and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, Finchley Park Empire. I spent my life from five years old standing at the side of a stage watching yeah. all the artists twice nightly, you know. And I thought to myself, well, this is it. I'm, I'm alone, so I might as well watch all these great people, mm. which was fascinating. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Max Wall, <coughs> oh. Max Miller. Mm. What, a, what an amazing man. My first entrance on this stage was so I was told countless times 
was my mother used to dress me in silk sailor suits and I had ringlets. And from what I gather, he was doing the, on the stove, a huge star, you know, Max Miller, huge star. And she put me down or gave me to a stagehand who put me down and I crawled on the stage and Max, Max Miller suddenly heard people laughing where no one laughed before. He looked round and there was this little tiny baby with a, a silk sailor suit with long ringlets. And of course he wore silk, you know. Anyway, he picked me up, walked to the front of the footlights as he used to do, put his foot on the footlights, look up at the gallery and said, I don't understand it. He's been calling me daddy all day and put me down and passed, <laughs> and I was handed back. <laughs> and I got that all my life, all my life. Oh, you're the one, you, you know, Max, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, we had a comment, for, for, just a comment for, from, uh, from Nick, who uh, said, uh, Darren, my wife and I enjoyed meeting you at the Marco Polo event in Cardiff back in 2010, so he remembers... Uh, with Mark Eden. Oh, right, yes. Mark Eden yeah. was there. Uh, very nice, thank you so much. Uh, also, Nick wanted to ask, um, was it fun to do the film with uh, Dick M uh, Every? Oh, so, sorry, sorry, Darren. Uh, was it, did you did you enjoy working with Dick, Dick Emery in, uh, in the oh, film you did God, together? Yes. Of course, I knew him through my family. You know, this, this, what a, yeah, absolutely. I mean, hysterical, hysterical, talented man. We had a great time, great fun. He loved cars. He loved cars. No, he was a lovely man. Uh, see what else we've got. Um, oh, Nick also mentioned that uh, they had an R Price shop here in in Salisbury, where he lives. So, well, we had two hundred, I think, at the end of the day. Hmm. And Rick meant Rick remembers uh, an R Price being in Piccadilly Circus. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we had we had a we had a lot. Of, we, we, it was basically run by my little brother, who you know died many, many, many years ago, but. Um, but of course, once you could download records, you know, that was the end of it. Every dog has its day. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you could download records, Gary, it's time to sell. You know, let's take to the hills, Gary, my brother's name. Mm. Uh, Stephen asked a um, question for, for you both. Uh, which performance or role in your careers are you the most proud of or you look back the most fondly upon? Uh, <clears throat> well, for me, I think there were a couple. There was, I did a, a play, not, not in the West End, uh, unfortunately, but I did um, oh, Streetcar Named Desire, which I'd always wanted to do. And I played Blanche mm. and I loved that role. Mm. I didn't have the director to really work with properly. Mm. So, so it was a big disappointment on one hand, I loved it, but it was a big disappointment because I knew it just had so much more to give, you know. Mm. It, well, I didn't also, we didn't have, the enough rehearsal time because it wasn't mm. a big production. Yeah. Other time was um, that I remember very specially. Um, uh, Dinsdale Landon. Oh dear, yes. Did um, a series called uh, Mickey Dunn, and I did one of the episodes, and we worked together. So I'd never worked with him before, but we worked together so well, mm. and we had a very emotional scene towards the end. And every time we came to this scene, we couldn't do it. Mm. We end up howling with laughter. Mm. And the director was getting more and more frustrated. Um, you know, even in the studio, when we got to the studio, because it was rehearsal and then, mm. then we recorded. Um, 
And even in the studio at the run through the dress rehearsal, we both started laughing. Well, the, the director, I mean, by this time, I think he was thinking of throwing the towel in and mm. getting rid of us and himself as well. <laughs> but we came to the actual thing. That scene was amazing. Mm. And in fact, the whole crew stopped and applauded. Oh, how wonderful. And I thought, we, this is why we couldn't do it before. Mm. And uh, I've had such fond memories. I have never, I think I saw it when it was first put out, but I've never have since. And they've lost all the tapes of that. Mm. And it was a lovely series. Mm. It really was. Din was just terrific. Mm. And I a lot of other things I love doing, but you mm. know, there are certain little moments that, no. Stand out. I think for me, the first one was Victim, when I was asked to play in that, because before Victim, I was a Shakespearean actor, and they said, well, you're a Shakespearean actor, you're not a modern actor. Then I did Victim, and you're not a Shakespearean actor, you're a modern actor. But I thought Victim was very good because it was so political in, you know, the homosexuality and it did help to change the law. And that I found a, a great film. And then I thought Where Evil's Dare was an amazing film. But I think this last one, Tucked, is everything that I ever knew is in that, that film, you know, and, you know, he's, a, you know, the, drag queen aspect of it all the dirty jokes are mine by the way <laughs> but that that i'm unbelievably proud of mm. unbelievably proud of because mm. it's everything i ever knew yeah and you know when 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 i said when we were in in la and it won everything the hollywood reporter was you know the the critics were so unbelievably kind that one thought to oneself that is what one's been trying to do for 70 years mm. you know mm. yeah on prime <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's wonderful yes it's on amazon prime for, for free included in, in the prime subscription so it's i recommend people uh, people check it out I've always um, been for free mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's just to, to... Married so often yeah. I could never say no. <laughs> and and just to, to, to finish up, um, uh, Darren, would you have watched the episode when it went out? I know you, do, do you like watching yourself? Do you find it a bit, no? No, the only time, funnily enough, victim, I remember seeing the rushes and driving away and thinking, how am I ever going to earn a living? I had no idea that it would start everything off. Um, the only film I ever really watched was 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 Tucked, mm. because it was it, it. You know, he's not he's not homosexual, but it's such a tragic figure mm. because his wife couldn't accept it, and he yeah. couldn't change. Mm. Mm. You know, and he lost his daughter, and you know he is—he's very ill now. And it's a, and and he's friendly with this raving homosexual. Don't tell me. I want to watch the movie. <laughs> no. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and, 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 and Annette, what did you think um, seeing the episode recently? Did you think it how, despite all the problems in making it, do you think it held up quite, quite quite well? I think it held up very well in the fact that you hadn't have a clue what was going on. Mm, yeah. It just didn't deviate. <laughs> no, it, it was, you know, there were areas of tension and uh, certainly the, the direction and the camera work was good, very good. Mm. Yep. And Darren, and um, 
you know, the actors work their little, you know, hearts mm -hmm. out, but uh, it still was terribly difficult to understand. But remember, they were shot very quickly over a few days. Mm. A couple of weeks. No, it wasn't a couple of weeks. I was on it for a couple of weeks. Really? I yeah. thought it was more a week. No, I was on it for longer than that. Do you? Oh. Yeah, because I actually phoned my agent and said, I want off this. And they said, they'll sue you. And I said, oh. She said, a lot of money. I said, okay, I'll stay on it. And that was like the yeah. end of the first week or something. And I, mm. said, I think it was like... Maybe it was 10 days, you know. Yeah, the Adventures of Sir Lancelot were five days. Mm. Five days. Mm. Um, um, William Tell were five days. Fun. Most of them that I did were all two weeks. Really? And in America, they because I worked in America at the time on a couple of things, and they said it takes you two weeks to do that. They do it in a week. Yeah. You know, and they're setting up behind you while you're That's sort of right. doing your lines and moving your yeah, fitting around very very quietly, yeah. and setting it up. And say, okay, let's amazing. go. And you go what? Amazing, amazing. Mm. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Darren, the, the actor who plays the um, retiring number two, I wonder if you had any recollections of him, um, Andre van Geisingen. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were, I worked with him many, many times. Ah, yeah. uh, very good actor. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, many, many times. He didn't know what it was all about either. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know him. I didn't work with him. No, I worked time. with him many times. A nice man. Mm. Nice man. Yeah, a very sympathetic character as well for the the episode. Um, I mean, are, are, are both of you quite proud to have the prisoner on your CV? Is it something that, looking back, you think, yes, it's nice to be a part of this this series? I've never thought of a CV ever. Mm. Um, I've got no idea. People tell me how many films I've made or how many plays I've been in and how many TV, and I say, oh, good, good. Really, that's good, right, fine. It's, um, I, I think it's, yes, it is, because it's still going, still bringing people in, and yeah. I think, okay. Talking yeah. point, talking point. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, but that, that's all right. A lot of the things I did are still going, so that's fine by me. <laughs> I am forever on. I, I suppose it's quite, maybe quite odd as an as as an actor, what sticks with you and what and what doesn't. What you think at a time is really going to be this fantastic thing fizzles out, and then do things like this keep coming back at you. I never thought, I never thought of that. Hmm. I never thought. I either thought they were a good film. Mm. or maybe not so good, but I never mm. really gave it much consideration. Mm. Yeah, you kind no, of always want to the next know. project. And, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. well, well, unless there's anything else you want to add, either of you, well, I think we might, um, might, might wrap it up. Um, any final thoughts, Darren and Annette? Not for me. I'd like to speak to Annette. <laughs> <laughs> An enjoyable mm. time. Yeah. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, everybody who's been watching. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me to talk about this wonderful series and so many other highlights of your careers. It's been a, a really um, fantastic evening. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. And uh, I'll take care and uh, be seeing you. Yep. Yeah. Bye. 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 However you turn it off. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, thank you to the audience, of course, for, for joining us. And um, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Take care, Dan. Take care.